Welcome to Neurology Now's podcast about migraine. I'm Stephanie Stevens, and we're delighted that you tuned in today. Our expert is Dr. Tisha May Monteith. She's assistant professor of clinical neurology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and the chief of the school's headache division. Dr. Monteith is also a recognized expert on the subject of migraine, and she's a member of the editorial board of Neurology Now. So Dr. Monteith, what are some of the characteristics of a migraine attack? A migraine is a very disabling headache disorder, or at least it's most commonly defined or identified by the moderate to severe throbbing pain, sometimes on one side of the head, sometimes on both sides of the head. It's associated with sensory disturbances, so patients can experience sensitivity to light, sound, smell, and movements. Perfumes, for example, is, is something that they don't tolerate very well. They often have visual changes. Some patients have what's called a migraine with aura, so they can see flashing lights, wavy zigzag lines, and that could be for some patients more disabling than the head pain because it could prevent them from thriving, for example. There are different headache phases. What are some of the symptoms of the pre-headache phase? Stiff neck, irritability, changes in appetite or wanting to go to the bathroom more frequently, some GI symptoms, for example, and that tells them that a headache is going to happen if they're able to identify it. Can you tell us more about the headache phase? The headache phase is something that typically lasts for most patients four hours to 72 hours if not treated, but some unfortunate patients go on to have longer attacks. And what is the post-headache phase? That's where the patient feels completely wiped out or as if they're hung over. The headache is gone, but they're fatigued. They can't concentrate. Sometimes they're restless. It's also a very disabling part of the migraine. And so what distinguishes this from a regular headache, for example? So that's a good question. Well, when people talk about regular headaches, most commonly they're speaking about tension type headache. Tension type headache is actually also a very common headache type, but they tend to be dull They tend not to have the sensitivities to light, sound. They tend not to be severe throbbing uh, associated with these visual changes, these different phases of a migraine, and they don't have the gastrointestinal symptoms that a migraine attack has. How do neurologists, such as yourself, typically diagnose migraine? So migraine is diagnosed by the clinical history, so based on the symptoms that patients are letting us know about based on a normal neurological examination, and at times based on normal brain imaging, if indicated. So we always wonder, what are the causes of migraine? Can you run those down for us? Yeah, so if I did that, I would be rich. (laughs) I'd be circling the world because no one knows the exact cause of migraine. Um, And so we have some some views about the different pathophysiological mechanisms. We know that it runs in families. We know that it's probably a genetic disorder because of the familial predisposition. We know that it's not a disorder of blood vessels that was once thought of decades ago and even longer than that. That's been something that's been debated back and forth. Right. And so we think of migraine as a brain disorder of chronic dysfunction with intermittent changes, often involving the neuron, which is kind of the basic unit of the brain and maybe some of its connections or the chemicals within. And um, there's a predisposition to having an attack based on sensitivities to certain triggers that sometimes can be identified. Some of them are external, like loud noises or bright lights. Some of them are internal, like hormonal changes or changes in sleep can be triggering, for example. So why is migraine three times more common in women than in men? That's a great question. So it seems to be related to sex hormones, they play a role. But in addition to sex hormones, there's probably a genetic influence that really determines that ratio and that risk factor. About 18% of women in the general population have migraine. Patients with menstrual migraines, for example, they're harder to treat. Migraines around the time of the menstrual cycle are longer lasting. Medications are, are different, therefore, they can take something. The headaches may go away for a little bit. That doesn't mean that men are scot-free. Um, as a matter of fact, there probably needs to be a bit more public awareness because men are less likely to get diagnosed with migraine headache and are often suboptimally treated. They don't get the right migraine-specific medications. That is very interesting, the differences between men and women, once again, in health. So 
Right now, in your opinion, what are the most promising treatments that are being used to treat migraine? Well, there's episodic migraine or migraine with aura, migraine without aura, and then there's the chronic migraine headaches. Those are patients that have headaches 15 days out of a month or more. Eight of those days are severe migraine days, and it's been going on for at least three months. So those are the tough, tougher patients to treat. The treatments are of two types, mainly acute treatments or migraine-specific treatments and preventive treatments. Of the acute treatments, the mainstay is triptans. Those drugs were specifically designed to treat migraine headaches. So there are different formulations and there's different routes of administration. And so they're working on and repackaging the way some of the older drugs are administered. We have tablets and injections, but now there are needleless systems for people that have fear of needles, for example. There is a breath and uh, powered nasal administration. So these are ways of trying to get the medicine in faster. The benefit of these newer formulations is that patients that have a lots of nausea and lots of vomiting can also benefit from treatment because there might be decreased absorption when using the oral tablets. That's a good roundup of current treatments. And what, in your opinion, is the most promising treatment as we look way down the line to the future? Well, there's quite a few. Some of the current treatments I did not mention are the non-invasive stimulators. So there's a supraorbital stimulation. This is like a little bit of a, it used to be a headband, but now they have this little neat device that you put on, on your forehead. And the goal of that is similar to a TENS unit, stimulating the trigeminal nerve that we think is involved in the migraine mechanism. So non-invasive stimulation, and also that's FDA approved, and that's something that people can get right now. The TMS device is something that people can get right now. That is to treat, also FDA approved, to treat acute migraine attacks. So those are things that are available right now. In terms of promising treatments down the line, the monoclonal antibodies, these will be the first drugs that are designed to treat migraine headaches preventively. And so you'll, you hear a lot of buzz about that. There are four monoclonal antibodies that are all in phase three clinical trials. So far, the early studies show that they seem to be safe and effective over placebo and useful for both episodic and chronic migraine headaches. So the monoclonal antibodies is something that potentially may get FDA approval in the very near future. Migraine patients should be on the lookout for that. There's also uh, simulation devices, the vagal nerve simulator, occipital nerve simulator, spinopalatine ganglion simulator. So all these are, are simulators that may also be potentially effective for the treatment of migraine headache. Well, so there's a lot available now and very much on the horizon that I think many consumers may not know about. Thanks for running those down for us. Finally, is there anything that patients can do to prevent migraine now? Absolutely. Migraine, we know, is a disabling disorder. And I would say that if you don't have a neurologist, you should get a neurologist. If you have a neurologist and you're still having a difficult time with your migraine treatments or with the frequency of your migraine attacks, then look for a local headache specialist because there are a lot of effective treatments that are already available. And some of it is a matter of dosing or changing classes or the way it's administered. So there's a number of things that, that a patient can do to get a control of their migraine headaches. In addition to the already available treatments are lifestyle modifications. So some of this is not just trigger avoidance, which means reducing chronic stress, uh, changes in sleep, but tapping into some protective factors. Now, this is not something that often gets a lot of attention, but they're protective things that you may be able to do. And some of this is individualized, but protective factors, including exercising, possibly deep breathing for some people, sorting out the things that might help reduce your frequency in addition to avoiding things that might be harmful for your headaches, such as particular food types or triggers. That's great advice all the way around. Dr. Monteith, thank you so much for helping us cover some of the most common questions about migraine. And thank you, our listeners, for joining us here at Neurology Now. I'm Stephanie Stevens. To read more about migraine, go to neurologynow.com and search migraine or subscribe free of charge to Neurology Now, the official publication of the American Academy of Neurology. 